Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. We're very happy to have you here. This is Hera from Chen, and I have Zoe with me. Hi. Um, hey, Zoe, how are you doing? I am doing well. Yeah, thank you. I'm annoyed because the sun's decided to come out, obviously, at the time of day when I'm inside. So Same. it's frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, right right at me yeah. so, um, for everyone who's joining us for the first time and you haven't been to one of our webinars before it's really relaxed we're going to um so we're going to explain to you how bloom works um which end is what the sessions we, we are running are and then how this taster session is going to run so one of the things that we have is we have a team member uh tiffany who was actually in the chat so tiffany if you say hi to everyone then people can see you um, and Tiffany's going to be helping out with the, the chat and um, she'll respond to any of your questions. We'll be asking you questions as we uh, go. So this is supposed to be interactive. Um, it is also being recorded. Your chat messages aren't, but we will um, refer to them. And uh, that means that you can watch the recording afterwards as well. So um, amazing. Let's get started. Let me tell you a bit more about Chen. So um, Chen is... Um, global volunteer community that uh, fights gender-based violence by creating online resources so things that you might be thinking of um, if you are facing like toxic and abusive situations such as what are my legal rights how do i stay safe online how do i feel better um, and these are the kind of questions that we answer through our work and a lot of our volunteers are survivors of abuse and so all of our work is uh, survivor centered and trauma-informed so Bloom is one of our latest projects and it, it's a remote trauma support service. So um, how it runs is that we have five courses and um, they're of varying lengths. So the one that um, we are gonna talk about today is a trauma resilience one, which starts on Monday. And how uh, a Bloom course runs is that we have two videos that come, so there are two sessions in every week. Um, Zoe, do you remember how long the trauma resilience course is? Because I always get the weeks wrong. How long in weeks? Yeah. Yeah, seven weeks long. So, seven weeks. Seven weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the seven weeks long. So there's um, there's two sessions every week. One is on Tuesday and one is on Thursday. So you get a video on Tuesday and you get a video on Thursday. And um, in each of the videos, there is um, a task or a homework that we ask you to do. So that means that you have that time to do it between the sessions and there's we have a direct chat link which we also send out so that means that when if you have thoughts when you watch those videos you can just the way that you'll be able to do it right now but in this in the setup you can actually see each other in the way we run it regularly you can see each other and you actually get a link to the video you can watch it and then send this your thoughts directly and then we share it we anonymize it and share it with the rest of the group this way we protect everyone's identity and also have a very um, nice conversation one-to-one -one about your homeworks and your insights. So um, yeah, that is how it runs. So we're gonna kick off with, we're gonna run this as if this is one of those videos that you're getting. So we're gonna combine two videos into one, which is why it's a <laughs> long webinar. Usually our videos are about 20 minutes long, 20 to yeah, 30, 20, minutes 30 minutes. Yeah. If Zoe and Allison are on them, they become 35 <laughs> minutes. If I'm on them, they're 25 to Never. 30. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. And uh, so we're combining two sessions into one. So you'll, you're will you going to get lots of content out of this. And this course has actually been written by a therapist uh, who has experience of working with uh, trauma survivors um, of, of all kinds from working with people who've been, who've survived um, you know, deadly fires to um, sexual assault and domestic abuse. So we, um, and we've also covered a lot of um, other forms of uh, discrimination that can have a very traumatic uh, impact, such as racism um, and homophobia. So we've made this course really inclusive. But before we get started, we want to find out more about you as well. So I'll tell you something about myself and then um, and then we'd love to know something about you too. So we're going to keep asking you questions in this um, video. Let's start off with what part of the world are you tuning in from? Just tell us in the chat like where, where you are. And I'll tell you where I am. I'm in Manchester in the UK and Zoe, you are? I am in London in the UK, a bit further south, yeah. Although you can probably tell from my voice, that's not where I'm originally from. That is, 
that's my location right now. <laughs> I, so you know that that tendency, I had the same tendency. I was good. I was about to say, but if you're wondering about my accent, I'm, I'm, uh, you have a time time. So. It's when people ask you like, where are you from? And it's like, do you mean like, where do I live? Or like my whole history? Yeah, no, for sure. Oh, nice. We're getting some, getting some answers. We've got some, some visitors from Scotland, which is really nice. Yeah, I went to university in Glasgow um, and I used to work in Edinburgh, so. Oh, no way. Oh, nice. Yeah. I've only been once, but it was it was very pretty. Yeah, for That's sure. Nice. Netherlands and Colombia. Oh, amazing. Oh, nice. Wow. <laughs> um, super. So we're going to kick off the session and, um, and we kick off with goals. So... I'm going to tell you what the goals for this session are. We're going to introduce you to the concepts of coping mechanisms. We're going to learn about positive coping mechanisms and some coping mechanisms which can become harmful. We can ident we'll identify when our coping mechanisms start creating problems for us and the role of coping mechanisms in trauma resilience. That's a lot of coping mechanisms, Zoe. <laughs> as I've said so many times. Yeah. Um, we get ready to say a lot of times we repeat it it's uh it's all throughout the session um yeah and we so we like to start and finish every session uh with bloom before we get on to the main content uh, we like to start with the grounding exercise um and the purpose of the grounding exercise is really to bring us into a kind of calm reflective space where we're ready to learn with each other um and we can also turn to these grounding exercises you know outside of the sessions as a way of soothing ourselves if we're feeling stressed or, or kind of in a heightened state of anxiety. Um, so we hope that this uh, grounding exercise can be useful to you. Um, and the one that we're going to do at the beginning of the session today is a little bit of visual imagery. Um, so what I want you to do is to find an object in your line of sight from wherever you're sitting listening to this. Now trace the outline of the object slowly with your eyes and as you run your eyes across it, imagine there's a black ink that is drawing the outline of it. Once it is done, we want you to imagine a bucket of paint. That paint can be of any color that you like. Now let that color drip onto your object until it's completely covered. And just imagine that the object is totally covered in that paint. And I'll let you think about that fully colored painted object for a moment as you keep it in your mind's eye. We're really living living life in slow motion. I hope that was yeah, a good I love it. So what did you choose and what was your uh, paint color of choice? Oh, I was, I mean, I was, as I was speaking, I wasn't, I hadn't, oh, okay, Bad how about you go? And I'm going to find an object while you're talking. <laughs> you do that while I explain. You do the own, your own grounding exercise that you want yeah. to do, and I will In tell you time. what I was yeah. thinking. The object that I have was a moisturizer, and um, I imagined that I would be pouring gold-colored bucket, like paint on it. So it, sound, it looked glorious once all the paint had uh, spilled over it, like an art deco item. So what about everyone else? If you want, you can tell us in the chat about what is it that you, um, what you drew and what was the color that you chose? Yes, yeah, I've just, um, looking across my desk, I still have a bottle of, of hot sauce, of sriracha, and I just I imagined <laughs> it filling up with like the color lavender and now to my mind it just looks like a bottle of I don't know like hairspray or makeup or something but don't use please don't use sriracha as, as hairspray or makeup that's yeah uh, don't. Not <laughs> that would be disastrous oh someone used a glass of juice with a pink paint laptop oh, bright pink nice fun. Um, lots of pink paints. I almost went for pink and I was like, okay, that's too much playing into the Chan theme. So I'm gonna like- I was gonna say, <laughs> it's cause they're with Chan with Bloom. It's the pink, it's the pink vibe. My yeah. mouse, Millennial Blue. I don't, Millennial Blue, I don't think I've heard of that shade before that I'm gonna look this up after It's this very moment. on trend at the moment. Okay. It's, been, it's like a color of the year, I think. One of the colors of the oh. year this year too. It's a, it's a shade of light blue. Oh, nice, nice. Got those yeah, there's a millennium light. pink version as well. It's like, you know, all those cafes that you see on Instagram that and the oh. galleries, art galleries are like the baby pink shade. So that, that's called millennial pink. 
<laughs> Millennium. Yeah. I do love pastels. Like Allison and I spoke about another week where in our video, I had my kind of pink hair and she had her, her pastel blue hair, just so coordinated. <laughs> awesome. Do you yeah. have a fun question for us as well? Because we do that. Uh, yes. We start so, every video. Exactly. Yeah. We like to add a little bit of levity in there as well. So we, after a grounding exercise, we start off with a fun exercise. Um, and this time it is, what is your favorite snack? Maybe it's something that is, has a really positive memory for you, or maybe has a cultural association. So tell us how it makes you, tell us how it makes you feel if you'd like. Um, let us know uh, down there in the chat. What would you, uh, what are you thinking, Hera? I was just looking down at my favorite snack because I just had it uh, before we jumped on this because I took a nap and then I woke up and I was like, oh, we have a webinar. So I must have something to kind of make me feel ready. Um, and I had, um, so I have lots of favorite snacks. So I'm going to choose this one because I just had it. Um, it's, um, how do I explain it? It's called um, Dahi Bale and they, it's like a Pakistani and Indian um, savory, sweet kind of snack. It's made of yogurt, chickpeas, um, very small bits of uh, onion and tomato, uh, lots of spices. So it's a bit, it has a little bit of a kick and it has tamarind sauce on top of it. So, oh, um, nice. Yeah, so I just had that before. I um, think it's still it's still in my mind. Nice, it's very fresh. Well, now mine's gonna sound really boring, but um, <laughs> we were talking the other week about those Biscoff biscuits, and now I just have a massive pack of them. Oh my gosh! And with a cup of tea, just perfect. Yeah, I think people in the chat might not know, but we have a weird obsession with Biscoff <laughs> going on within the Bloom team. It's because where I live, there's um, there wasn't any like kind of. The kind of cafes that I like, there's only one that has opened. It's a vegan cafe, and they have a Biscoff cake, which is really good. And that's the only cake that I can get around me. So since it has opened, I have been having a lot of Biscoff cake. And because I keep mentioning I'm having it, everybody in the Bloom team is is now like eating more Biscoff in their life. <laughs> it's spreading. Yeah, your Biscoff influencer. Yeah. <laughs> So we have um, someone saying they're eating plantain chips and crisps. Yeah, I love plantain yeah. crisps. It's so good. Yeah. So pretzels, uh, which good for you, but I just I've never been able to get into pretzels. Um, do you like pretzels, Zoe? Yes, I prefer like um, this is gonna sound so I don't know snobby, but like I love fresh pretzels. You know, like big bready fresh yeah, like those. pretzels. Yeah. Pretzel crisps, yeah, I I could go for pretzel crisp. I like we're seeing a very savory trend coming in in our chat. It's interesting because yeah, I yeah, that's good. Too. Yeah, the spicy tomato snaps. Oh, I've never had this. Me neither. Ooh, this that's is all good. Liz, drop in a link. Tell us like, what, <laughs> yeah. yeah, tell us what those are like. So yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. Okay, oh, hey, super. Well, with that, we're ready to kick kick our session off. So. Um, we're going to talk about coping mechanisms today. That's where, why we're here. Um, but before we get into the details of coping mechanisms and how they're related to trauma, we wanted to first give you an overview of the trauma resilience course. So I explained a little bit of it before, but we're going to, in that course, we're going to explore, uh, explore different kinds of trauma, uh, such as you know racism, other kind of prejudice, um, bad and painful childhood experiences. Um, how trauma, we are also going to talk about how trauma um, can incite changes in our minds and bodies, um, and then different therapies, tools, um, and tips for trauma recovery. And how do we foster like trauma resilience inside of us so that the trauma uh, is not what ends up defining who we are and how our life is going to be. So it's a seven week course. Hey, I remembered. <laughs> so <it's seven laughs> <week course. laughs> and it's delivered through bi-weekly videos, which I've told you. But one thing I didn't mention before is that not only do we send those videos on Tuesdays and um, Thursdays, we send a daily message, which has more information, reading material, but also um, reminders for um, what homework we had given or something else is coming up because that helps people can, stay on track with the course we really want people to invest time in it and uh, really think of it like um that you're investing that time in your own recovery and you can find all this from the bloom website which tiffany can drop a link in the chat so you can find out more about that and um 
let's kick off with trauma. So that's a word that we hear a lot um, and we all may have different associations with it. Um, so for me, for instance, I grew whenever I, uh, my father is a doctor, so I used to hear that word in my house, but to me it meant like an accident or something big happening, which, you know, which is resulting in people um, being rushed into hospital and in the emergency like space. And, and, and that's what I thought it was. And obviously, as you, you know, we start thinking about it uh, and we, you know, do you realize that there are different kinds of traumas. So we wanted to get into the root of what is it actually mean when we use the word trauma. So the word comes from Greek and it's um, first meaning was actually wound. Um, so it's very similar to like how my, my, inter my association with the word um, and why medical professionals use it. But nowadays we have a more like holistic understanding of trauma that, um, you know, it can be a dif different kinds of wounds. They don't just have to be an exterior wound. It can be an interior wound. Um, and, you know, it can be a piercing experience. Um, and a wound comes, even though the wound comes from exterior and affects our interior, our perceptions and feelings and reactions to the world are, you know, can be affected by that. Um, however, we know that there are ways to heal from a wound. So whether it's an exterior wound or interior wound, we know that there is a path to recovery. In the field of psychology, trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event. And these events usually involve a risk of harm or danger to ourselves or to other people around us. So you can have a traumatic experience, even if the trauma happened to someone else, you can still you know, suffer from the impact of that. And one thing to remember is that what's traumatic is always personal. So we do not find all situations to be equally traumatic and we all may you know, uh, differ in how we react to it. Oh, and I hear my cat, you're gonna hear my cat <laughs> as I'm talking because uh, he's, he's just woken up. So we might have similar experiences to someone else, but, uh, but it, may, it may affect us completely differently. So we think that that's really important to understand because, and a good example of thinking about it is, is a natural disaster in your community it might be a flood or an earthquake. So it's happened to everyone and everyone would have post-traumatic um, sort of effects. But that would look very different to, to different people. It could be a loss or fear or grief. Um, and of course, the sudden nature of trauma means we can't predict or prevent you know, what, what's happening. But actually, in our, uh, in our bodies, in our minds, we can build up those protective factors to help us cope with the aftermath of it. So maybe now is a good moment for you to think about what's been helpful for you when you have been dealing with adversity in the past. Is it like, you know, your body and mind may have developed natural ways of coping and you didn't even realize it. And, and your body and mind are doing all this hard work to keep you alive and stay well. Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of where we, we come into this concept of coping um because really can for it can refer to any way that we kind of make sense of these feelings both the natural ways uh of coping or maybe some of those that we learn from in our environment so overall coping refers to the ability to manage demands those could be internal or external demands um, and sometimes these demands may even be perceived as threats particularly if we've experienced some level of trauma in our lives and in every day life, we cope. That's what we do. We receive demands on a regular basis and we act on them without much awareness, really. And because we just love our visual imagery here at Bloom, um, there's kind of another visual image that might be helpful in thinking about this. So imagine you're carrying two buckets. In one, you have your stressors and in the other one, you have your coping mechanisms. If both are balanced, you should be able to keep your balance. Now think what would happen if you didn't have enough positive coping mechanisms and your stressors bucket still keeps filling up, those demands are still coming in. You'll probably feel like you're exhausted, maybe like you don't have the energy to carry that stressor bucket anymore, um, and maybe like you're losing your balance. So you might be able to remember kind of with this image times in your life when you felt that you weren't really, you were not coping well, or maybe you were losing your balance. You might have felt like the day was just going by too quickly and you didn't get to do what you wanted. Um, and we might fall into patterns of repeatedly doing this. So 
where we just keep doing thing after thing after thing without really disconnecting from those stressors and those demands and without putting into place any conscious effort to keep ourselves healthy and balanced. So the idea of having coping mechanisms in place is that you can include them in your everyday life and make them a part of your routine. So you don't just go to them when you're feeling really stressed and overwhelmed, but you just have them there kind of to, to refer to always. Because on the contrary, if they're, if they're part of your everyday life, they're handy and ready for you to make use of them whenever you want to, and not just when you feel like it's too much or you just really need to. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to talk about some coping mechanisms that are positive. So um, let's start with, you know, physical exercise. We all know it, even if we don't always do it. <laughs> so um, exercising reduces the level of stress hormones that are in your body and it, they give us that boost. So we don't even know that our body and our mind are getting that like feel good endorphins um, running through us, but uh, it helps us. So even if you're just standing up or running here and there, just being out and about helps. Um, and of course, a lot of people then go work out a lot or have enjoy sports. We have cooking, which is a great way of involving our senses and our creativity as we try new things and alter recipes. People also enjoy cooking because it's a way of just letting things flow and you can kind of, you know, focus on a sensory experience. Or it, it could be, you know, submerging yourself into fiction, you know, reading or watching films or TV shows, um, reading books can take us away from who we are and where we are and into like the imaginary world. And that can um, help us. Um, but, you know, maybe try avoiding a horror movie or a very um, uh, dramatic movie, which may, you know, trigger bad memories. So something to be careful of. I, I just have to jump in and say I love horror movies. So actually, it's... I love horror movies so much. Oh my gosh. Halloween is coming up. Just excited. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> so um, all, music is another one. Um, food for the soul as it's called. So, um, you know, you can also think about dancing, a way of like enjoying music as well as exploring your, how your body moves and getting like some exercise out of it. Um, and, you know, moving your body to a rhythm can be a very powerful experience um, because you can feel yourself in sync with something else. If, if you are someone who li likes dancing or singing or any of the things that I'm mentioning, it would be great to hear about that in the chat. Um, being outdoors, this is a very big one for me, actually. Um, um, my husband can go for days without going outside and make, it will make no difference to him. Whereas if I don't go outside every day, it, it, it has an impact on me. And I find that is a very good way for me to you know, get my minds off whatever uh, mm -hmm. is happening. Yeah. So um, I have a, a every day I go out for a walk. Um, so, you know, if, it, that, if that's something that you do, even if it's walking your kids to school, or going to buy some groceries, those can be really important moments. Uh, another one is practicing your breathing and grounding techniques. So we've gone through one grounding technique and we're gonna go through another one at the end. Um, you, there are so many out there, you can just Google them and find ones that help. In our course, we try out many. In fact, we do a different grounding exercise every single session to help people experience um, and choose what works for them. Um, there's an, another thing is taking care of your body in a way that makes you feel good. So that could be um, taking a bath or painting your nails, um, doing your hair, putting on a face mask, uh, makeup, whatever feels good. Um, another one is doing some art. So um, I recently started doing that, Zoe, and as you will know, because I'm sharing it all the time all with the Gen team, is where I'm drawing and uh, that helps because it's something that's creative, I'm able to kind of get lost in that activity. Mm. Oh, there's there's such excellent images. I'll I'll just pop that in there as well. The ones that you've been doing recently, <laughs> the drawings of um, a Ava DuVernay and Alexandria Casio Cortez. They really lovely. <laughs> yeah, it's very good to, for me to like make them, and it's a good uh, uh, you know therapeutic activity. <laughs> Um, there is meditation and yoga. It's something that's very popular and you know, studies have shown that it's really helpful for um, connecting with our bodies and um, yoga especially can help us practice our breathing, which helps with stress levels uh, and is a, a good long-term coping mechanism 
um, and good for building resilience. And lastly, it could be just having, you know, a good time by indulging in some humor and, uh, and why is it good? It's good because studies have shown that a sense of humor is an indicator of resilience. Um, so uh, for, a, for a little boost in your week, try getting in touch with a friend um, that you know is funny and makes you laugh uh, or, and, uh, or watching a comedy show that you really like and really um, you know, diving right in with that humor. Zoe, do you, are you a fan of comedy? Oh my gosh, such a huge fan. Um like sitcoms. I also love sketch shows. So like sketch comedy, I'm really into, there's some really good stuff on Netflix right now. I remember our therapist Paula saying she's really into friends. And I loved hearing that because it's like, you know, someone who deals so much with, with trauma, like really, really having some levity um, in there. And I think, did you say the other week that you're watching, uh, there was a program that you're watching, was it Schitt's Creek? Yeah. So you know what I, this is a funny show, but the, I, I want to, uh, one of my pet peeves is that I think there's too like there's too much animal abuse that is just like discarded. Oh, no. Shit's Creek. I was watching it and I, I finished it. There's one episode that I really, really didn't like. And I think if anyone's watching it, they'll probably know in which like someone runs over a cat and they just treat it like a piece of comedy and it's just up to me, like, you know, I have two cats and it doesn't matter if I have two cats or not. So um yeah, so I think those kind of moments make it a downer for me. But yeah, it's a good show. It's funny. Um and quite um quite progressive which is uh great uh we oh tiffany says um she's been watching working ones i love that show it's so it's so good a really good friend of mine uh has been recommending it to me for ages so now i i definitely need to watch it now yeah Someone let's said dancing in their living room nice yeah we uh, let's let's hear some of yours oh we also had cuddling my dog that's really lovely yeah so um, important fun. good pet time um i had a good cuddle time with my cats before um i came here in fact one of them is just roaming around and may make an appearance impromptu <laughs> appearance <laughs> i was gonna say like we had some contributions earlier from the cat i think you should come <laughs> in and you know start start talking about coping <laughs> um Oh, the thick of it. I've also heard really good things about that. Um, I think it's maybe on Netflix right now. That's... Yeah, I, I, I watched for the first time uh, a couple of months ago. It's, it, it's scarily accurate. And it, <laughs> you're like, what? It, it's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> nice. So um, we, we've talked about all the healthy coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. and I think it's time yeah. to go to the unhealthy ones or what is healthy and can become unhealthy. So Zoe, tell us about that. Yes, absolutely. Um, so when we say un, we've introduced this as kind of like unhelpful coping mechanisms, but what do we really mean by that? I mean, it's still a coping mechanism, obviously, in as much as it helps manage uh, the demands on our energy and our time that we were talking about earlier. However, just because a technique is kind of helping us endure stress and pain, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's then healthy for us. Some coping strategies can kind of be unhelpful in that they lead to, they, they create more problems in our lives. And we're, we're sort of consciously avoiding using the word bad or negative here, and we'll talk about that a bit more later, um, because a coping mechanism is still something that helps us manage stress and managing that stress, doing that isn't something that we, we should have to feel ashamed about, um, but we just know that its effects may also be negative uh, still. Now, we're going to go through a list uh, of some unhelpful or unhealthy coping mechanisms. Um, and as we go through this list, please remember that the, your trauma is not your fault. And neither is whatever coping mechanisms you have used or you use um, to get through that. The purpose of reading these coping mechanisms, these unhealthy ones, is not to shame anybody. But it might just bring our attention to behaviors that we may or may not have been doing to manage difficult emotions like stress and fear and anger. So the first uh, unhealthy coping mechanism that we're going to address is drinking alcohol or using drugs. So substances uh, may temporarily numb pain, uh, but they won't in the long term resolve our issues and substances some substance use is actually likely to introduce new problems into our life so alcohol for example is a depressant that can make us feel worse and using substances also puts you at risk for developing a substance abuse problem and it could create legal issues or financial problems and a variety of social issues which then themselves become stressors that that are difficult to deal with um, there's overeating or undereating, 
So food uh, can absolutely be a real source of comfort when we're feeling low or anxious. However, we might just want to keep an eye on our relationship with food uh, such that it doesn't become a more unhealthy one because binge eating or under eating will not serve the needs of our mind and our body. And, and obviously, um, if, you're, if you feel like you're struggling maybe with one of these issues, uh, please seek out the advice of, of the doctor, of a doctor would be, would be a good idea. Um, another thing that's on our list is, is sleeping too much. So sleeping is a very key part naturally of our, of our well-being and creating good sleeping routines is very important to stay healthy and well. However, if you feel you're using sleep more to disconnect from the world and not have to face reality, um, this is when it might become a more unhealthy pattern of behavior. There's also overspending. So, you know, treating ourselves to buying or enjoying something new that we want can make us feel great. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with some self-indulgence now and then. It can, it can be, um, it can be really positive. It can be a very bright thing to do. However, if you're maybe spending more money than you have, or if you feel like you should spend a large amount of money, um, like there's pressure to spend money in a very short amount of time, or using spending as kind of a way of coping, it might be a way of disconnecting from emotional problems by focusing on physical things instead. Another unhealthy coping mechanism is self-harm. So self-harm is when someone intentionally hurts themselves, usually is a way of, of managing emotions. And perhaps the most well-known form of self-harm is cutting, but there are other kinds as well. And while self-harm is often talked about and can be used as a kind of self-punishment, um, self-harm can also be used to manage really difficult feelings such as fear and anxiety and stress and numbness, which in turn themselves might be caused by a particular situation or a difficult memory. And people who self-harm often report a sense of relief after having done so. And because of this, self-harming can become a really difficult habit to break. Um, and then finally, we have unsafe or risky sexual encounters. Now, there's no, obviously, there's no right way to have sex. However, when we've experienced trauma, particularly if that trauma was related to sexual violence or to some kind of intimate partner violence, we might have the habit of responding to stressful situations, maybe when our traumatic experiences with sex are triggered by engaging in risky sexual encounters, such as unprotected sex with a stranger in an unsafe environment. And this absolutely is not a behavior that we need to be ashamed of. Um, it's just that noticing some patterns in our sexual behavior can be useful in trying to figure out if we're having sex because it's something that we like and enjoy, or because it helps us kind of ignore or banish those uncomfortable feelings. So that was, that was, there are many, there are a variety of coping mechanisms that can be unhealthy. That wasn't an exhaustive list. Um, and like we said, the, the purpose of this list isn't, isn't to cause any shame or make anyone feel ashamed of themselves. Um, it's just, these are some of the common habits that, that people turn to that can sometimes end up creating, creating problems in people's lives. So, yeah. Yeah. And the thing, the, the, key thing here is that when we have these coping mechanisms, um, the way to think about it is that they become unhealthy when we start using them consistently as a form of avoidance of our realities, of our lives, of, of the situations that we're in. So that's how to keep an eye on them. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to share like two common ones with you. So exercising is a good one because, you know, we all think about, well, you know, eating too much cake is is, is bad um because it's overeating but we almost never talk about over exercising um because you know exercise is, is supposed to be healthy for us and it's supposed to keep us fit but actually it can easily become an unhealthy coping mechanism because um if you are you know if you're working out uh, excessively not only can you uh, create like you know physical tears to your muscles dehydration and all those problems but also it's about creating a dependency. So you're swapping one addiction for the other. It, you know, it becomes addictive because you feel like you can't get through your day unless you go for that run or you, you know, you play uh, a game. I think the important thing here is about like dependency and it's about making sure that these coping mechanisms are just that. There are things that, you know, could be so like soothing behaviors or it could be um, activities that are, you know, coping in the short term, but not something that you need uh, 
to get through your life. Um, so another example would be like social media. So, you know, like everyone else, I also love going on my uh, socials and just like swiping and see what people are up to, getting some inspiration for makeup or what to watch on TV or, um, you know, even where people are going on holidays. And it's a nice way to spend some time when you just want to like, you know, not think. Um, but if you start comparing your life um, and we start thinking, oh, well, you know, we're not as thin as them, we're not as um, accomplished as them, and our life isn't as picture perfect as someone else's, then that can then that behavior of looking at other people's lives through the lens of social media can become unhealthy. So um, it's the way, again, to think about it is, is it can become a cycle of where something you want to do becomes something that you need to do. Yeah. So we repeat it and we repeat it to do a point of access and we become dependent on our behavior. Um, so that, so over time we start experiencing a lack of enjoyment and more dependency. And that's where you know that you've got a problem. Yes, absolutely. I really, I mean, I relate to uh, a number of these, the social media thing um, in particular really sparks something. I've, there's also a term that I've heard um, dread scrolling. I only came across it recently, but like how social media can be such a positive thing. And I know I reach out to people through it and it can be a very rewarding thing. I certainly find it that or seeing funny things online or whatever, but it's just turned into this unhealthy pattern of like scrolling through either upsetting things or things that make me, yeah, like you said, compare my life to someone else's this dread scrolling thing, um, to be aware of. Also, we've had, um, someone in our chat mention, uh, something that's maybe uh, an unhealthy mechanism or just something that, that's difficult to experience as maladaptive daydreaming. So I'll oh, thank you for, for mentioning that, that that's a really good, um, a really good example. So yes, absolutely. There, there are many um, mechanisms that we can look to that might not have the, the effect in our life overall might not be positive. And, and one way of understanding why we use these unhealthy coping mechanisms that we kind of wanted to bring our attention to um, in this session is called the internal family systems framework. So have you ever heard the expression, like a part of me feels, this is related to the inspiration behind the internal family systems framework, which was created by Richard Schwartz in the 1980s. And it's a framework that's now been used by psychotherapists all across the world. So this framework, this internal family systems framework, suggests that we think about our self as a, actually a collection of many parts that are working together to make up a kind of family. And the way that these parts work together results in how we are and how we behave and think. So there are main parts, uh, there are three main parts of this family according to this particular theory. Um, so the first part is the exile. This is the part of us that was uh, neglected, abused, hurt, scared, and maybe damaged by the experience of trauma. This is the part of ourselves that carries the weight of those traumatic experiences. And so it's the part that's most vulnerable. And practitioners, um, particularly when working with experiences of trauma, often talk about the exile as the, as the part of the self that in that moment of trauma, was, was affected by it. And so it's kind of a time-based element of well as those, those emotions that are all wrapped up in that trauma kind of remain as part of the exile from that moment, moment of time when it occurred. Second, we have the manager. That's the second part of the system. So like the manager of a business or an organization, I feel like it should be you, Hera, who's talking about uh, this bit, the manager. Um, the, the manager runs our day-to-day our -day abilities. So the manager cares that everything is going smoothly. And so it will control things actually to stop that exile, that first part from exerting its influence. And we'll touch uh, a little bit more on this in a moment, but if you have a very loud inner self-critic, that voice in your mind, or you have a perfectionist attitude to work, or maybe engage in a healthy coping mechanism to an excessive level like exercise or working, that might be your manager at play. Um, and finally, the final part, of this system is the firefighter. And the firefighter's job is to do exactly what it says on the tin. It's to put out fires. That is just doing whatever it takes to extinguish the negative feeling or thought that's threatening us. 
Um, and this might be where some of our negative coping mechanisms start to come in. So self-harm or substance abuse or extreme eating habits. The firefighter is doing damage control to manage the emergency of the, these negative emotions, but it doesn't necessarily care about what it damages while it's working. And like we mentioned just a moment ago, this framework can kind of also help us understand why healthy coping mechanisms or how healthy coping mechanisms become unhealthy coping mechanisms um, if we think of this manager of the system. So putting excessive effort into aspects of our lives that we can control at least to some extent. So that could be work or physical fitness or what we eat. That's our manager micromanaging our lives as a way of maintaining control and again, just keeping that exile out. And as people who experience trauma, we try so hard to separate ourselves from all the negative feelings and sensations that are associated with that trauma, because these sensations can be so overwhelming to our systems. And it's just exhausting going through those cycles of being hyper vigilant and really, really focused on things that are associated with the trauma or potential dangers and, and total dissociation from those things. And on the other hand, we kind of we might be worried that our exile will sort of take control of us and that all those negative thoughts and feelings and experiences that are associated with our traumas will become overpowering and our ability to sort of function in everyday life will come to a standstill. And because of all this, sometimes we just need a break from the task, the exhausting task of managing our emotions. And that's maybe where our firefighters and our managers start to step in. So whether our unhealthy coping mechanisms represent our manager or our firefighter, understanding them can just bring us to a new level of self-awareness. And ultimately, this understanding can be used to recognize the part of ourselves that is scared and fearful and anxious, that, that part of us that is vulnerable and really just needs love and care. I mean, recovering from trauma overall is such a huge topic to get into. I mean, we've written a whole course on it for that exact reason. Um, but it's worth just just briefly saying that recovery isn't about banishing one of those any one of those parts of that family system, not even the firefighter. It's just about restoring balance in the relationship between those three components of our emotional well-being. This is a working relationship that might have been kind of set off kilter by the trauma, just so that these three components are able to function in harmony without one of them taking over to too great an extent. And the point of this explanation isn't to say that, you know, you have to know the internal family system uh, framework to be able to understand your coping mechanisms or to change them. We just find that it's useful to think of, like take a step back and think about why, you know, it is that we have these coping mechanisms and why it's okay, like we shouldn't have to be ashamed of them um, or even to like have to stop them right away, but to give ourselves that space to recognize why they exist, what they are, and what aspects of our emotional needs are they addressing. There might be negative emotions or anxieties or bad memories that we just haven't even given ourselves permission to deal with or that are just too difficult for us to deal with at a particular time. So this is how coping mechanisms are linked with our traumatic experiences. We may... Um, we may look to a more extreme like way of managing our feelings um, or may even seek to numb them because those feelings are stronger because of the trauma. So for example, the rate of self-harm is highest amongst survivors of childhood abuse than amongst the general population. And that doesn't mean that people who've experienced um, trauma necessarily use unhelpful coping mechanisms and people with none or few experiences of trauma have the healthiest coping mechanisms. No, that's not the case. But when we've been exposed to an, an extreme situation or environment, which was out of our control and has made us feel helpless in that moment, um, as in the traumatic experience, it can influence our sense of safety and the ways that we interact with our environment and therefore the ways in which we are able to look for comfort in our environment. So by using um, unhealthy coping mechanisms doesn't make us bad. You can look at coping mechanisms, even the ones that are less healthy as evidence that you are resilient. Your body and mind are working together to look out for you, to trying to manage a whole host of difficult trauma related emotions. They're identifying the ways in which, you know, like 
you can really get through um, those traumatic experiences. So with us in this um, course and through, you know, the different things that you do in life to better understand and process your trauma, you know, you can start identifying the ways in which you are already coping. And it's such a powerful step in, in your recovery. But know this, that you, you know, you've already been resilient and that you're not alone. Your body is keeping you safe. It's been there for you. And, you know, it's trying to, you know, lessen or trying to manage those unhealthy coping mechanisms, you know, you can take your time with it and that it's not something that has to be ha in that process of, you know, managing those um, coping mechanisms it doesn't have to be as painful as you think. So um, that's the purpose of us talking about this because mm -hmm. um, it's too easy to say, you know, this is a really bad thing and I just shouldn't do it or you shouldn't do it and someone telling you. But when we understand wh where those emotions come from and where those uh, sort of crutches come from, we can then start to think about how we slowly let go of that crutch or like start putting less weight on it or start using it less. So um, that's, that's the purpose of us. Yeah, and recognizing the underlying need that, that's making us turn to the crutch, that kind of aspect of of, of the self that, that kind of feels the damage of the trauma and someone... Um, Someone brought up something really interesting in the chat. In the chat, I've just seen about um, another aspect of the. I think another aspect of the internal family systems, um, and essentially another uh, another way that the the sense of self is is affected by the trauma. So that's it's really that's a really good point, and it's really part of the kind of goals of the overall course. Isn't isn't telling anyone like ways. Oh, here's how you should be reacting to your trauma. Or here's a way. Here are ways to react better to it. It's it's like Harris said, just about understanding the ways that we've already been looking out for ourselves, but also giving us options to ways that we can acknowledge our kind of our own needs in, in recovering from this experience. Um, so yeah, that's that's the content for today's session. That was our introduction to to coping mechanisms. Um, we, we hope it was like a useful introduction and in kind of understanding what coping mechanisms are, how they're related to trauma, um, and how we can kind of use this understanding to, to acknowledge parts of ourself that, that, um, that, that need acknowledgement, that need comfort. Um, so if you're interested in signing up for the full course, um, head over to our website. I think Tiffany's dropped the link um, and you can read more about the course and register there. Um, and yeah, we'll be sending out a, a few, of this webinar, we'll be sending out a YouTube link um, soon. So if you wanna go over some of the material again, um, or had to step away during the session, or maybe, maybe you just loved it so much that you want to listen to the whole thing again. That's that's good too. <laughs> that's fine. Um, and yeah. Great. And so we end every session with a grounding exercise. So mm -hmm. we are going to do that together, all of us. So um, we want you to uh, breathe deeply. Breathe in and then breathe out. We're going to count from five, four, three, two, one, and then let out a big sigh. I actually try like wiggling my shoulders as well because I, I realize I, I hold a lot of tension in here. So um, that's how we end all of our sessions. And um, someone made a joke. Uh, well, someone made a comment that uh, one, that we breathe too hot, too 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 loud. I think that was me. <laughs> I mean, really, so it's not the first really, time someone has said that I breathe too really loud. Mute yourself. Do not breathe <laughs> and creep people out with your breathing. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm so conscious of now as well. I'm gonna step back <laughs> while I do this like breathing. So everyone with, with us, let's do it together. So I'm gonna count so you can keep track. So, um, yeah, we also like asking people to tell, tell us about one positive thing that you took away from the session. Um, and it would be great to hear that from you now in the chat, if you feel comfortable. And we tell people to have a feel good phrase that they say out to themselves at the end of every, for getting through the video, through completing this section. So, and really own those words. So, um, whatever it is that you say to yourself to really like, you know, get yourself motivated. Like we want you to say it out loud. So 
since we can't hear you, so you really could be saying it so many times and it'll be fine. And then we want you to tell us what's the one thing you're going to commit to doing for yourself and just yourself. So not for your kids, not for your family, not for your friends, but for yourself. Uh, we call them moments of happiness. So what is your moment of happiness going to be this week? Um, uh, why don't we start with you, Zoe? Um, tell me, so, well, actually, let's start with it from the beginning. So tell us one positive thing that you took over from the session because we've been interacting with people and learning things as well, right? Yes, we have. Um, I, I'm i going to look at maladaptive daydreaming. I've kind of tangentially heard mm -hmm. about it, but I'm really going to look more into that. Um, so that's great. Um, one positive thing I was like, I mean, it's kind of the, I guess what we're trying to do with the whole course, the, the most positive thing I, that I, I love about this material is, um, just looking at the ways that we've already been resilient. So I think I, that mantra, I think is just so powerful and so beautiful. Like you've already, I have already been resilient. Um, so looking at all the things, all the ways reacted mm -hmm. to our trauma as a, as a kind of positive. So that's that's a positive thing. Yeah. What would you, what are you going to take away from today? Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take away that moon rabbit loves when people breathe loud. Like in a viewer. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> that's a positive thing to take away from today. So yeah. now everyone thinks you're like your breathing techniques are creepy. Uh, so we, got, Thank you. I feel really valid. You, <laughs> you don't know how much that means. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, um, in terms of the thing that I'm going to do for myself this week, um, I like going out for a bike ride, um, almost every day, but actually for the past two days, I've not been able to do it. So I'm oh. thinking I'm going to do it tomorrow because I have a day where I'm doing, I have just lots and lots of like meetings tomorrow. And I, okay. but I have a gap of two or three hours. I'm thinking in those two or three hours, I'm going to step away and I'm going to go for a bike ride. I'm going to like walk by the river, um, actually that's a lie. There's no river near me. There's a key. So I'm gonna walk by the key. Oh, not a <laughs> not a river. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, enjoy the water because I find that really calming. And um, yeah, do do that. I think that's the best thing I can do for myself. That's my moment of happiness. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I um I was telling Tiffany in one of our sessions this week uh, in terms of the thing that I'll do for for me this week um that one of my favorite clothing shops has just released a halloween line of clothing and as i said i'm a, I'm a lover of all things spooky and halloween so i'm gonna see if i can get my hands on some some halloween clothing as a little <laughs> september brightener but um yeah we'd love to hear if you want to share yeah something from the session or something that you're gonna do for yourself this week um would be lovely to hear and there's no thing we, we like to say this sometimes but there's no thing too small i think sometimes with like affirmations or or self-care it feels like we have to start with the biggest things yeah just, yeah this Indeed. even the smallest moments um can can bring so much joy and just a little bit of levity um particularly like tiffany just wanting just a nap because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> she only slept yeah. like one and a half hour today because her baby was up a lot oh gosh yeah, yeah yeah i don't think she got a lot of sleep i feel like a lot of our our chat amongst us is just about like our sleep, you know, how much we've slept in that, <laughs> um, at a particular time. Oh, nice. We've got some things coming in. So we have affirming emotional intelligence. I am. So this is one of the like feel good phrases or mm -hmm. mantras. So I'm so much more than the things that have happened to me. This is a really powerful one. We I, love love it. Mm -hmm. I will congratulate myself for showing up here. Despite being unsure, I want to laugh more. Yes. Mm -hmm. We want to laugh more as well. Um, yeah. Which yeah. is why all of our videos have a lot of like laughter. <laughs> laughter. Yeah. yeah, why we're laughing with each other. I love that. Uh, congrats. Do please do congratulate yourself for for showing up here because like so often I can just feel like oh I don't have time for this or oh I don't really need this or whatever it is. So just showing up here. Well, yeah. Thank you for being here uh, with us so much. It, it really means a lot. Yeah. Um, we also have turning up and recognizing the need to care for myself. Mm. That's nice. so, you know, people say like self-care is, is, is a radical act uh, and it, it's so true, uh, especially because we, you know, many people are conditioned or have grown up in environments where that has not been prioritized or they've not been like mm -hmm. you know, brought up with the fact that you need to indulge yourself and, and give yourself like the same kindness that you're expected to give to others. Mm -hmm. So it's so important. 
And um, Moon Rabbit says, uh, I can recognize if I'm in exile, if I'm micromanaging myself or firefighting. Nice. Excellent. I, I'm, I hope that was a, yeah, useful, useful yeah. framework. We've got a few more people saying that they kind of like the IFS or the, mm. the internal family. What's the internal family system. Yeah, if you want to look up the framework, internal yeah. family system. And I love the, I love the sort of, um, this feel good phrase of like, I am whole. Mm -hmm. That's so important. And yes, more fun and laughter for everyone. It's mm. so important. So this is, I'm gonna tell you a funny story, but I remember that when I was, um, the first time we did one of these videos, um, I sent a link, uh, obviously we shared it everywhere. And my mother was like, you're talking about trauma and domestic abuse and you were smiling a lot <laughs> and i was like yes mama <laughs> it's because i'm not always talking about it and i'm allowed to laugh <laughs> and also talk about like hard like you know people have some really fixed views of like how these spaces like are or have to be and i think in bloom we really want to make sure that you know these conversations are can be so heavy that they don't feel like that and that again is part of the fact of not letting trauma define how we are and what kind of experience mm -hmm. we can enjoy. Um, we we need to like we are humans who have like you know different like you know in things that we enjoy and we need to indulge mm -hmm. in that. And it's that also is a good form of rebellion against you know. Yeah, I was just gonna. I, the word I was gonna go for was defy, but yeah, it's like a defiance of of a traumatic experience of something so serious as to in in the face of of having that to to show up and laugh anyway. I yeah, I really like that. That's, that's oh, really and cool. someone's good. And someone's nephew has a birthday. That's oh. and I see some cake. Well, guess how how much would it make you smile if you turn up to the birthday and you realize it's a Biscoff cake. What are the chances? <laughs> Hera, the more that you talk about Biscoff cake, the more you realize you will have to make this for me at some point. <laughs> I'm now expecting that. <laughs> I'm just going to take you to the vegan cafe. <laughs> and you can have the same one that I'm having. Um, so some really interesting points about like how, um, so someone says, my micromanaging has made me a brilliant strategist. Mm, that's an interesting insight. And yeah, I think we're talking a lot about kindness, self-kindness, which is great. I feel like it's one of those things which are, um, it's kind of awkward to talk about self-kindness, I feel, because especially in, 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 in cultures where you are taught, like in mine, where you're taught to be kind of think about others before you think about yourself. And it's all about the family and other people in society. So I, I've always found conversations on self-kindness kind of strange and selfish. So when I talk about it, it really helps me because I'm like, I'm kind of deconditioning myself that saying I can hold both things, you know, together. I can be kind to others and kind to myself and they are not contradictory. Um, so yeah, this is a really helpful conversation for me too. So um, I think that's it with, for us today, right? So uh, Zoe? Yes, yeah, no, that was it. I was just agreeing with your last point. Yeah, really nice takeaway about self-care. Yeah. Exactly. So we're going to share a video recording of this. We will have, we have, after the trauma resilience course, we have two more courses. So we're going to do taste recessions for them too. There's going to be a Spanish version for this uh, session as well. So if you um, know someone who would like to attend that, then tell them to follow us on social media where we're going to be posting about it. We also have uh, a newsletter, um, which we will share the link off when we share uh, the link off. The link of the link off when we share the youtube link with you mm -hmm. and um thank you so much for being here for showing up for yourself for giving us the trust mm -hmm. um to hold this conversation and we hope you have a very um, nice week and you get to have those moments of happiness yes thank you so much for being here uh we've really enjoyed sharing this space with you all it's been great thanks thank so much you. thank you